Well, welcome to the Environmental Experts um, webinar series. I'm Ken Owen with Channel Islands Restoration, and we're glad to host uh, another interesting webinar tonight. We've had quite a few, actually. Um, oops. I uh, want to talk first off about Channel Islands Restoration. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We do habitat restoration, environmental consulting, and environmental education. I would think most of you know that, but always got to uh, remind folks. We're in our 20th year. This, this year is our 20th uh, year anniversary. And uh, as a reminder, uh, as a nonprofit organization, we really rely on um, donations from the public uh, for a big percentage of our budget. So I see there's uh, something showing up in the Q&A already. If you um, have questions for our presenter tonight, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and not the chat, that will help. And I will attempt to curate them a bit. And if there's dub, uh, double questions or something like that, I will um, attempt to make it go a little smoother. And if you can get them in early, that helps. We always get a big flush at the end, of course. But uh, if you can think of something along the way that you want to ask, feel free to type it into the Q&A. So um, our environmental experts uh, series, this is kind of a real quick thing flying by, but just to give you an example of all the different uh, uh, webinars that we've done on all kinds of different subjects, mostly of course, um, environmental or Channel Islands related, but not exclusive to the Channel Islands. Uh, but it's, there's a lot of wisdom on that uh, page and that page is cirweb.org webinars. So do go back and check out some of the other stuff that we have on there if you haven't seen it. Okay, and I will stop sharing. I want to introduce uh, Cynthia Powell, who is CalFlora's executive director. Uh, Cynthia, after three years as Cal Flora's GIS project manager, uh, in 2016, she became Cal Flora's executive director. She graduated with her MS in GIS, which is Geographic Information Science. I always learned it as Geographic Information Systems, but that was like 20 years ago. Either so. is fine. <laughs> Science. In 2010, um, uh, uh, yeah, her master's was in forecasting in 2010, uh, Macomney River water supply based on MODIS remote sensing snowpack images. She's been examining what was under the snow, the plants, ever since. She coordinates all of Cal Flores programs, research, outreach, and advocacy, as well as fundraising and project management. That sounds like you're in a busy executive director. I don't know what that feels like. So go ahead and uh, share your screen. Are you, okay, great. There you go. We're seeing your, uh, okay. Oh, what a cute acne spot. Isn't that cute? That's the, oh, I recognize that one, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping that a lot of you tonight recognize a lot of these species. And my goal is to talk about how to use Calflora to help protect Channel Island native plants which I know many of you are involved, actively involved in doing. And I'm also learning about Channel Island native and non-native plants. Um, I've only been to the Channel Islands twice. One of them was pretty, one of those times was pretty recently. So I use Cal Florida to kind of go there remotely from far away. So I'm gonna go through some slides 
about CalFlora and native plants of the Channel Islands and then go live onto the CalFlora website to show you and kind of interact more with what tools you might use in your work and volunteer work and play on the Channel Islands. And as Ken mentioned, if you have questions, you can type them into the Q&A. And that way, if there are urgent questions, um, someone can let me know to answer them before I proceed. First, a little bit of background on what is CalFlora. Many of you know, some of you might not know what we are. We are, here's our team. And as Ken mentioned, my MS is in GIS, Geographic Information Science or Systems. And CalFlora is a database. So that's how I ended up in this role. Um, I'm learning a lot about plants, but I'm not a botanist or and I'm not a botanist. And then here's the rest of our team. We have some developers because so much of CalFlora is a computer website. Um, so we have people who know how to code things and make them accessible to the public. Bookkeeper, then we have Pete, who's our weed manager, software director, weed manager I'm gonna talk about briefly tonight. It is a set of tools for managing and tracking invasive plants and any treatment, whether it's goats or hand pulling or chemicals, whatever um, organizations or agencies are doing to, to track treatment to see if it's effective or not and to create reports on that. That's weed manager. And then we have our development director. We are a 501c3 nonprofit plant database providing information on wild California plants for conservation, education, and appreciation. And just like Channel Islands Restoration is also a nonprofit, when Maury sent me an email about tonight or proposing something like tonight and collaboration, I thought, oh, that's a really good idea. I've always wanted to know more about what you do. The database contains over 8,000 native and introduced plant species. That's every single plant in the state that grows wild. So if you're wondering, where is it? And how can I find it? And what does it look like? That's what you can use CalFlora for, or one thing. We have over three and a half million plant location observations, and that's growing every day. They are in mostly the format of points, but we also since 2010 have been offering the option of adding lines or polygons to CalFlora. That would be, for instance, if you have a patch, a population, and it's to, instead of counting every single of the grass or even something big like a tree, instead of counting every single one, you can just say within this area, we have X number of plants or X uh, percent coverage of the species. That's how you would use polygons. Lines are similar, maybe along a trail, hiking trail or a stream. If you have a species there, you can just log that easily instead of doing point after point after point. And one of the main reasons, as far as I know, as far as we can tell from Google statistics and talking with people, people use CalFlora and, and probably you too, because we aggregate data from many different sources. We serve data from iNaturalist. We serve data from CCH, which is California Consortium of Herbaria. That's specimens, those pressed plants stored in libraries and botanic gardens. Um, we also serve data from smaller data sources, county parks, state parks, forests, federal lands, lots of data sources all in one place. And that's where this 3.5 million and growing number comes from. They're not all just people using the CalFlora phone app or as Ken has used um, the photo upload tool to add observations from all different places. As you know, for better or for worse, plant names do change. And it's really hard to keep track of those changes. We're not the authority, nor do we want to be the authority on plant nomenclature, but we reflect the current authority. So Jepson, CDFA, sometimes CNPS, and update those plant names in CalFlora. And whether you're looking for Mimulus or Diplicus, you can search by an old name or a new name. And we the verb we use is crosswalk. 
So we crosswalk those together. So no matter how old the nomenclature that you're working with is, you can still find that species in Kelflora. And that 30,000 number is also growing by, mm, I'd say hundreds every year, probably. We serve over 300,000 plant photos. Most of those now actually come from Calflora observations. Ken, for instance, has a couple photos that we're using as reference photos. They also come from sometimes Cal photos, which is part of uh, the UC system. But that is either a reference photo on the taxon page or just embedded in an observation of a plant. I'll get more into that in a minute. We have about 80,000 unique visitors each month or 2,600 a day. And that number has increased since spring of 2020 with the pandemic. Um, and then we have about 4,000 active data contributors. And I hope by the end of tonight, you're all inspired and interested in adding your plant observations to Calflora also. They don't have to be special. They don't have to be unusual. They just have to be accurate. I saw this plant, this species at this location. If you're not sure what the species is, there's a lot of ways we can work with that. You can put it in as unknown. You can put it in a group called Plant ID Help Group with photos, et cetera. But we do, we do like it when people contribute their observations to the database. The Calflora database contains all 8,000 plus native and introduced species. That's all wild plant species in the state. And as I mentioned, we receive many data feeds from other data sources, including CCH2, which is the new version of CCH1, which is plant specimens, and filtered, very filtered iNaturalist data. We also filter the CCH data. The CCH data, if it's inaccurate, it's not usually with the plant ID being accurate. It's uh, inaccurate. It's usually the location because some of those are from the er, you know 1800s, early 1900s, when georeferencing wasn't as easy as it is today. So um, we filter those out that are in the ocean or or clearly wrong in terms of the location. And then with iNaturalist, it's usually the other way around. The location is pretty spot on because most people use the app and triangulate with satellites to get a good location. But sometimes, even though it's only research grade, we find that the iNaturalist data is not so good in terms of um, ID, the quality of the IDs. So we filter those also. And we need your help to, you know, there's millions of observations as you're combing through Calflora and using Calflora. If you come across something that's a mistake, whether it's from CCH2 or iNaturalist or another data feed or a you know, they call it native Calflora observation, there's a way to comment on the record and that sets off a chain of events so that we can, and you can, and together as a team, we ensure the highest accuracy of data in Calflora that's possible. In terms of aggregating data, I mentioned that there's a lot of different sources, two of the bigger ones, INAT and CCH, but also, I mean, I don't expect you or want you to read this whole list, Audubon Canyon Ranch, BLM, CDFW, Marin County Parks, you, know, you can just kind of scan it and glean, and this isn't even a complete list, glean some information about where the data you're looking at or where the observations you're looking at in Calflora are coming from. And this is a, com you know, it's a conversation for another day, but if we could add CIR to this list, um, that would be great. You know, it enhances the database to have, and I think probably CIR, our plant data would be of high quality. So that would be something to pursue um, after yeah. tonight. Yes. May I break in with a quick question? Yes. Um, so I'm an avid iNaturalist poster. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said that you're getting some of your data from iNaturalist. So, um, but you, when you search for me in California, you only saw the limited amount of observations I had in there. Mm -hmm. So do, does that information not transfer over? Well, I let's have... let's look at that um, when we go online into the kind of the active, the interactive 
session and just try and look you up by your handle in our iNaturalist data feed and see if we can find you that way. It could also be that your um, license in iNaturalist does not allow us to have your observations in CalFlora, in which case you can change your license. Um, so I think it'll be good for the audience to see that with a real live example like your name, Ken. So that's really good. I wrote that down. We'll do that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, let's talk later about the question on there. Uh, that'd be great. Yeah. What is Calflora not? Because the Cal at the beginning of our name, a lot of people think we're part of the UC system. Sometimes I think we should just change our name to, I don't know, Flora of California or something. So it's not so confusing. But anyway, we're not part of the UC system. We're not part of Cal Photos, and Cal Photos is part of UC, and we serve their photos to make it more complicated. So um, we're also not part of Calypsi, the California Invasive Plant Council. That's its own separate nonprofit. We're not part of CNPS, the California Native Plant Society. That's its own separate nonprofit. And we're not part of Calscape. Calscape, we have something called a planting guide, which is similar to, to Calscape. Actually, I want to show when we go to this live session, I'll um, show you that as well. Anyway, Calscape is part of CNPS, and Calflora has been a 501c3 nonprofit since 2000. Our funding is about a third from fee-for-service work, a third from donations, and a third from Weed Manager, which is the software that I mentioned earlier for tracking invasive plant management and treatments and creating reports. Um, on your invasives. This is a snapshot of one of the popular taxon report pages. If you look at Google statistics, you can see that most people who land on Calflora pages are looking at these. You have the map with the blue dots showing the distribution of the species across the state, bloom period, then um, scientific name, author or authors, common name or common names a brief description, a shrub that's native. Um, this one also has pests or pathogens that affect it. So you can click here to see which pests or pathogens affect the huckleberry and where it's located. And photos. There's one taxon report page for each wild plant species in California. So why don't you type into the chat if you've been paying attention, how many taxon report pages do we have then? Or Q, should it be chat or Q&A, Ken? Should uh, be the Q&A. Okay, Q&A, please. Barb says 5,000. Susan, okay. Susan, Andrew, Kevin, Reed. Oh, no, Reed gets 3,000. It's about 8,000, 8,500. Um, yeah, over 8,000. Because we're serving here, let me just go back a few slides for those of you who are wondering how you would possibly know this answer. All 8,000 native and introduced species, 8,000 native and introduced wild plant species. So if each of these has one taxon report page, then that's somewhere over 8,000. Now, the tricky part is that when the plant names change, when right after they change, we kind of leave the page of the old name open for a while and say, this is not the current name. So there it'll direct, it'll redirect you to the current name, but we don't want to close it down right away. So anyways, around a little over 8,000, 8,500. In terms of crosswalking old and new plant names, here's an example, a gorgeous photo that I actually should have um, given photo credit for might be Steve Matson. I'm not sure. This is an erythranthi now, microphylla. It used to be one, two, three, four, five different mimulus names. Gutatus, various variety, three different varieties. So how are you supposed to keep track of that? Well, you're not. You leave that to us and you can search for any of these names or you can just look up, look up mimulus. You can look up erythranthi and you'll find it. Matt asked, why do plant names change? And it's mostly, there's a lot of different reasons, but it's mostly due to genetic research. They realize, oh, all the genus, for the genus Mimulus, we thought these were all related, but actually some are Diplicus and some are Erythranthi, and they're not all the same genus after all because of DNA um, research that they've done. 
So, but it's more complicated than that, Matt. And if you want to know more, it's it's fascinating. I mean, it's it's like very detailed and in depth and fascinating. I have information I can send you um, about that. And on the CalFlora homepage in the upper right corner, it's at calflora.org is our homepage. And then the upper right corner is where you can sign in. And if you sign in there, I'll send you information about plant name changes, about upcoming hikes, about um, our data sources, about like everything that I'm talking about tonight, basically. So that's a good way to stay informed. And there was a recent plant name with Sinoglossum grande. Of course, I can't remember what the new name is. And I, I just let people know that's a name that I can't really let go of. It was so easy to remember and seems so applicable based on how it looked like a like a dog's tongue, tongue the, the leaves. So why did they change it? Well, again, due to DNA research and it wasn't actually in the genus Sinoglossum anymore. So, oh, thank you, Adelina. You're right, Kimberly. Oh, you're there. Hi. Another way you can use Calflora is to find where to buy seeds or starts for different species. Of course, natives only. We serve this information for native plants only. So if you're wondering, you know, if you if the Calflora planting guide, which I'm going to go over, says this would grow well in your garden or restoration site, and you want to figure out, well, where can I get it that is close to me? Um, I'm, I'll show you how to generate this list of nursery and seed sources. And this gorgeous verbena photo, photo is by Adam Chasey. Specific to the Channel Islands, I am going to switch over. This is a query that I ran in Calflora to look at native plants on the Channel Islands. I drew a polygon around them. Actually, this is rare, rare plants. And does anybody want to hazard a guess in the Q&A? Why is this one pink and all the rest, or, or maybe you even know, if you know, or if you want to have hazard a guess, why is this one pink for all the rare plant observations that Calflora serves and the rest are purple? Andrew guesses the only one seen in the wild because it's a new sighting, says Linda. Good guesses, not quite right yet. Introduced another great guess, not quite right. See what Andrew says, because <laughs> I like it the most. <laughs> I might. I don't actually. We should see what we should click on that one and see which which species that is. Let's endangered is another guess. Extinct is another guess, because that's the starting results page for your query. Okay, so let's. Do you see my Chrome now? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Location where type specimen was found. So what grows here? An observation search on the map. Okay, so here's this pink one. I'm asking you guys to guess why this one is pink. Let's see if it is my favorite or your favorite. Nevin's woolly sunflower. Ooh, looks nice. It's my new favorite. Look at that. All right, this is the taxon report page where we got when I clicked on that name to learn more about it. And so that's this, a single island endemic. It's an island endemic. And it's interesting that there's this observation in Santa Barbara and these in Los Angeles. Let's look into that. But first, why is that thing pink? Here's our legend and here's the answer. The purple ones are simple points. The squares are obscured if you wanted to obscure the location. The pink one, so the, for this uh, woolly sunflower by Dion, Dion BJ Dion, BJ decided um, to collect a polygon, or, or I don't, not collect, but 
to add as an observation a polygon for that species into Calflora. And if we want to see more about the, let's go to location. Well, let's go to the editor and just see this polygon. So here's the shape of the polygon. I don't know if any of you know this species um, well enough to gauge, or maybe BJ Dion is even on this call. It says, I only surveyed the slope within the polygon, but the population could extend over the ridge line to the south and should be surveyed mapped. I collect specimens for CADA and SBBG and collected seed for our seed bank as well. Wow, great. Habitat. So it's also on uh, San Clemente Island. I, I didn't remember that it was on Catalina, but I've seen it on San Clemente. Uh-huh. Well, that is why it's pink, because it's a polygon. And the rest of these are simple points. Um, not that they're any better or worse than the polygon, but that's just how the people decided to add them. And this was a query I did looking for rare plants only from, oh, I didn't even include CCH or iNaturalist. So let's see what, if we add CCH and iNaturalist to our query, we're gonna go from 110 to 130. And if you, you can sort, let's fold up the map. We know we're looking at the Channel Islands. You can sort by species name. Oh, there's that nice one we saw earlier by David Greenberger. Can sort by observer, by notes, date, county. Well, county is not so interesting in this case. ID, you can also change, and this is, this is a little advanced, so stay with me for this second here. Uh, you can change what columns you want to see. So you could say, I want to know actually uh, elevation in meters and have that show up after the ID and habitat after the elevation. And, um, you know, county is not actually important to me because these are all all um, on the Channel Islands, so I'm going to remove that one. Okay, apply. And now we have the elevation in meters in this column, and then location description over here. What was the other thing that I added? I thought I added one more thing. Elevation, plant. Oh, 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 sorry. I didn't remove county. I need to remove it from here. And then the second thing I added was, oh, it's in three counties. Linda says the Channel Islands are in three counties. Good thing I have you all to set me straight. So, so let's add that back. County, okay, apply. All right, so elevation is here and I put county back because it's actually three counties. Wow. Here's an iNaturalist record and I can tell by the IN at the beginning. D. Lori, um, and elevation negative 86, that looks a little interesting, I don't know, something to explore a little bit more. Let's see what the other, let's see, to Barbara County, here we go, we can scroll through these photos. And then um, in terms of the iNaturalist ones, Ken was asking about his iNaturalist records. So if you want to know, um, okay, good question, Kimberly. Let's go to the iNaturalist, Calflora. Here's the homepage. Explore the wild plants of California. Here's where you should register if you would like to be informed about Calflora. And um, the emails are very high quality, I tell you. <laughs> so to add observations, including iNaturalist observations, you can go to multiple photo upload, which is how Ken added some photos recently. Here, add records from iNaturalist. And what is, if you could, um, Ken, into the Q&A, write what your iNaturalist handle is, and a few more of you, if you want to write your iNaturalist handle in there, we can look at a few of your observations and see if they're actually showing up or not. Watching the Q&A for some INOT handles. Mm 
Yeah, you'll have to give me a moment. Okay. Or you can say it out loud if that's easier. We'll use the Joanne's first. Explorer DJ. Can also search by species, by common name, by date, by what's in your map area. So we could go down to the Channel Islands and look for just those, um, just those down here. Wow, it's hanging on this query. You might either you have a lot in there, Explorer DA Joanne, DJ, sorry, Do Joanne, or why else would it be hanging? I probably have a hundred in there. Oh, there my, my handle is uh, K O W E N two zero zero zero. Holy moly. Could you put that into the, um, is it okay to, to put it into the Q and A? Uh, I don't think I can. As a... Okay. You can read it out loud in a second. Let's look at Joanne since we have hers open. So these are, wait, why is Bonnie Nickel? I think there's something strange going on because these are not all the same handle. These are different people. Mm -hmm. hmm. Let's try it this way. And zoom in here and say in the map area, well, I guess we could leave that, or that's going to be maybe a lot if we look at that. Let's just look at Santa Rosa Island. On Santa Rosa Island, which iNaturalist records do we not yet have in Calflora? Gosh, I wonder if that's going to be too many. All right, we'll zoom in really, really far. So let's search for that. Only 10. So that means we can see what other records are already in Calflora for this part of the island. And we can also add to Calflora what hasn't already been added by our automatic data pull. Our data pull takes research grade in order to show up here. It also has to be research grade. And we filter for density and cultivated and all these other filters. And for some reason, these didn't come through. So we can look at them. Let's fold up the map and just see if you know these observers or if you know these people or if you know these species. And if does this Castilea look about right? Castilea finis, subspecies of finis. Does anybody know that to grow on Santa Rosa Island? Yeah, it, it does grow on the island. Okay, so huh. since that's probably right, I'm going to go ahead and add it. To I mean, the picture looks like it certainly could yeah, be right. Yeah, it's hard to tell. <laughs> it's hard to tell. Um, I'll go ahead and add it to Calflora. And now that one's in Calflora, and it shows up as IN colon. And that's how that'll be the unique ID for that observation in the database from now on. So, all right, let's try again with the handle. What's your um, handle, Ken? K O N. And then the two zero zero zero. And this, we're still looking at that part of the island. So let's back it out a bit. Do you think you'll have a lot of observations for? I have, yeah, oh yeah, I have them for all the islands. Okay, so maybe I'll just. What about for the western part of Santa Cruz? Uh, like maybe. 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 How about like that? All right, I'll back it out even more. Okay, we'll see what you got. Certainly and these again are not yet in Calflora. There we go. So these 85 records, I'm sure Ken, and we can look him up by his, by this handle, does have iNaturalist observations in Calflora already. Um, and we can look at those. And Ken, if you'd like, just take this, copy, paste it into the chat hosts and panelists. All right, so just the hosts and panelists can see that URL. It's a great way to share information into and out of Calflora is by taking this URL or whatever URL that you wanna share and copying it and pasting it. Also, if you have a question for Calflora and you wanna email us, Calflora, contact Calflora, here's our email address. Please include the URL so that we can better help you. 
So let's look at Ken's observations. I'm going to go start from the top, the CalFlora homepage. Well, so here's the CalFlora homepage. Observation search. So you can search for plants. You can look at the news. You can read about CalFlora. Add observations, my observations, my CalFlora, the phone apps, what grows here, great places planting guide, which I'm going to get to in a minute. But let's just see what observations we might have for, oh, no. I did that's the URL. Okay, so it's K Owens 2000, right? No, O N, not Owens. K O N 2000. Yeah, right. And let's just say anywhere and see what our, this is our automatic iNaturalist feed has pulled in. Oh, interesting. Nothing. Well, I guess we better get to work over here. From that URL that I pasted in, um, into the panelist chat, you can start adding your observations to CalFlora from there, Ken. So um, now before I get to your questions, which I'd like to get to in just a couple minutes, we have enough time to answer them. I wanted to go back to, let's start from the top, from the homepage. You're like, okay, here I am on CalFlora. I'm, I'm registered, I'm signed in, and I want to know what grows uh, on the Channel Islands that is native, and specifically what grows on San Miguel Island. You can either draw a polygon around it or around all the islands. Let's do that, actually. Or you can zoom into just one island. Under area, you can draw polygons, start drawing. You can make your polygon as precise or imprecise as whatever works for you. There, did I get them all? Think so, right? Stop drawing and That's plant. Okay, so native species grow here on the Channel Islands that we have in the database. One thousand two hundred eighty-one plants out of eight thousand or eighty-five hundred. That's impressive. Let's not group by life form. These are native ones. Hold up the map, and you can scroll through these. Now, if you want to know what to plant, if you have a restoration site or a garden on the Channel Islands or anywhere in the state, let's go back to the home page and go to the planting guide. If you have, let's see, which island should we do? Where do you have the most restoration sites? Which island? Uh, Santa Cruz, uh, but okay. I have even more observations probably from Guadalupe Island off of Mexico. But, but what about Cruz. in terms of restoration? So where are you working on, where is CIR working on restoration projects right now? Which island? San Nicolas Island. Okay. So let's just see what CalFlora suggests would grow well on San Nicolas Island. I'm gonna fold up the map with this little blue arrow here, not group by life form and just have a look at these 31 plants. And those of you who are on this call and who are, let's make it a little bit bigger. Um, look, looking at these species, some of them are, are attract pollinators, butterfly icon, Is anything surprising about what grows well on this island? And if you think 31 is too few and you were hoping for some more options, we can change the constraints. You can also, under tools, you can send this list as an email to someone else who you're working with. On this restoration project, you can download a spreadsheet and you can go to what grows here in this eco region. And you can watch a video about how to use the planting guide too. So the planting guide suggests plants that will grow well at a certain location, but I was hoping for more than 31. 31 is just too limiting for me. So let's uncheck that because these are the constraints and the more constraints I have checked, the fewer results I'm gonna get. Let's not omit plants at the edge of their tolerances. Let's not use soil factors to choose the plants. Uh, let's let's leave it at low water and not shady and see 
if we get more than 31 with the new constraints. Oh, we went up to 95, okay. And if you thought 95 was too much, again, you can start um, checking more constraints here. You can also indicate plants that grow well with, you know, coyote brush or whatever it is that you already have growing there that you want to know what complements it. Let's scroll through this new list with fewer constraints. And if you want to know where to purchase starts or seeds for any of these, ooh, look at this calicortis, wow. Click on the scientific name and you can go to the taxon report, which we've looked at. There's 8,500 or so of those on Calflora. Click there and see the taxon report. Perennial herb that's native and some of the varieties are rare, which is why you have these yellow, um, yellow squares indicating there's some data coming in that's obscured. So it's a rare plant. So that's the taxon report. You can look at the location suitability. Why did this calicordus show up as being suitable for this location? Well, the location values, so this value that I chose on San Nicolas Island is 195 meters, and the elevation that this calicordus can tolerate is anywhere from 5 to 2540 meters. Precipitation on this part of the island is probably the whole island, 11 to 57 inches and the location value, oh, sorry, the plant tolerates 11 to 57 inches and the location value for this place is 13 inches. Four months is the wet season for this location, et cetera. And this, that's why this calicorda showed up on our list. Minimum death, soil, soil texture, calcium carbonate, available water, AWS Available Water Supply, I think that stands for. And then the third thing you can do, so we tax on report, location suitability, why did it show up here? We also have CNPLX link, which stands for California Native Plant Link Exchange. And it looks like, oh, the only place that sells it is really far away in Arcata. Is, is that surprising? Is it a calicortis? Is that what we're looking at? Yeah. Well, yeah, I do a lot of nurseries uh, supply calicortis. It's a bulb plant, be a little harder to grow, I would think. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this. Uh, let's look at a different one. See if there's something that we could find a little bit closer by. Here, the Cerzium, but you can find that closer. So this is attracts pollinators, blooms May, June, July, photos. And we can go to the taxon report, location suitability, why did it show up here? And also CNPLX, yeah, there's a lot of places to get that cerium. Okay, now I wanna make sure I leave enough time for your questions. We've talked about the planting guide. If you're planning a garden or restoration site at any location in California, we've talked about iNaturalist and different data sources. We've talked about the Calflora database and how you can use it to learn about native plants growing on the Channel Islands and how to hopefully also protect them through that knowledge. What questions do you have for me? Go ahead and type them in the Q&A, please. Or I guess for Calflora, for me to answer about Calflora. And since um, Cynthia has been answering them all along, just go ahead and type away, folks. Any questions for her? Here we go. Edward oh, asks, how to submit a photo? Good question. Let's look at that. Um, from, let's, I always try and remember to start at the homepage, calflora.org. Add observations. Multiple photo upload. And here you can add multiple photos into one observation or multiple photos into multiple observations. Because sometimes you might have, you know, 10 photos of the same observation. You can put them all on a stack and then you upload them here. And um, let's see, I'll just show you how the drop down works for, um, this is not my photo. Is that a penstemon of some sort? 
just a random photo I had on my desktop. Let's pretend like it's a penstemon. So once you start typing, does it look like a penstemon? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Once you start typing, the system knows, okay, based on what you've typed, you might mean something like these. These are all penstemon because I started with P N P N S. And then you can say, I, and I'm, you know, not going to upload this because I don't know what penciling this is, and this is also not my photo. But as an example, um, let's see. Let's just say it's blue penciling. This photo is also not georeferenced. You might, if these are coming in from your phone or from a camera with a GPS embedded in it, they will be georeferenced. But if it's not, that globe will be red, and you can choose. Gosh. Let's see, choose your location where you saw it. And the good thing about this tool, if you do have to choose your location, because you don't, if your photo is not georeferenced already, is it'll like, like, let's say it's near Round Top uh, here near Kirkwood that you saw this penstemon. The next time, if you add another photo and it also has this red globe because it's not georeferenced, it'll start you off where you where the penstemon was. So if you have a bunch from the same location, you don't have to go to the map and find it over and over and over again. It, it, it'll it help you out with that. Edward, does that help? And then Scott had also uh, asked that question early on, do all states in the US keep this kind of data? If not, then hmm. why not? That's a great question. I think they all should, of course people who understand the value of data for protecting native plants um, or the value of data for understanding pretty much anything would probably agree with that. Some There is a floor of Oregon and uh, there's an East Coast state, I think it's Connecticut, that might have something a little bit similar. But if you, I mean, it, it's probably just like a funding thing. So if you know of someone who wants to start, um, you know, the, the mini flora for Minnesota or whatever you want to call it, we would be happy to help get that going. Um, Anonymous says research grade and naturalist observations are not automatically pulled into the database. You need to manually add them. So yeah, that's good clarification. Some are added, some are not. We have a whole bunch of filters and I can't explain for each one of Ken's that were showing up like why they weren't pulled in. But if you see them, if you go to Start from, oh, start from the top, go to add observations, go to records for my naturalist. So if you're seeing records show up on this list when we were generating a list, that means they have not been added and there's a variety of reasons. So you can pull those in manually as I did for that one, Castilea. Um, and then the rest of the observations from my naturalist that are in Calflora, you'll see in default searches. Um, Okay, so Edward says that helped. Kimberly says that answered the question. Are there any other questions? Hi, Vijaya. Does CIR uh, populate San Nicolas Island with a plant from Arcata, for example? <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> or do you have a nursery? No, there's an. Uh, on all ch eight of the Channel Islands, there's a prohibition from bringing in plants mm. from the mainland. That's good. So even if they grow on the mainland and the islands, you we still would not mix uh, the genetics. Uh, right. So uh, they're all, uh, and, and for that matter, even if you were to take seed stock from the island, uh, nobody grows them in a mainland nursery and then brings them back to the island. So that's just an agreement by all the different agencies that work on the Channel Islands that you only grow them on the island in which you're going to yeah. plant. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense in terms of everything. That's good, good to know that every single island has its own nursery, too. I didn't know that. Um, Edward is asking, if you're not listing a photo, can the uploader learn why? I think you mean from iNaturalist, for instance, right, Edward? So if you're not seeing an observation in Calflora, can the uploader learn why? Is that your question? 
the person trying to upload it, can they learn why why it wasn't audited in the automatic feed? I'll just assume that is the question. Um, that because it's a computer algorithm running this thing, don't take it personally. It's just, <laughs> and it could, you know, can can you learn why? I mean, you could maybe look at it closely. It, does it have in the location description anything indicating that it might be cultivated? Is it not research grade? Actually, if it's not research grade, it won't even show up here. Um, is there a density of that species in the database already? Because we don't need to be adding a bunch of stuff that we already have. So you can't really know, I mean, it's, you can't know personally, but you could hazard some guesses based on what Calflora might want from a naturalist and what we're trying to keep away from. Does that your question? Okay, here's another one from Linda. Cynthia, when do you want to come to Santa Cruz Island? Right now. I'm an NPS volunteer. Oh, that would be great. Thank you, Linda. I would love to. Um, my, my husband's actually headed there tomorrow. So lucky duck, poor guy. Um, so let's, Linda, if you could either go to contact Calflora, from, so from the homepage, contact Calflora and send us an email here. And that way I'll get, we all get those support emails and I can write back to you and we can plan that. Thank you for that invitation. Um, Edward says, do you publish what research grade means? That That's an INAT definition. That's not our definition. Research grade, my understanding means that two or more people have said, yes, that idea is correct, but that's not something that we are, you know, that's, that comes from the iNat and iNaturalist end of things. Joanne says, lichens are included in Calflora. Can those be imported from mushroomobserver.org, which carries fungi, including lichens? You know, we have bryophytes, so we don't have fungi. Let's just look at some bryophytes since Joanne brought this up. Observation search, go to the islands, and under other sources, look at bryophytes. Do you think there's, hopefully there's something. Let's look at these two, in map area, search. So this is gonna be plants and bryophytes. Oh, this is a lot. There's no way to filter out, at this point, we just added bryophytes a few months ago. I wonder if they're in the legend as bryophytes. Nope. So you just have to look through and see where the bryophytes are. Gonna be, I guess we could sort by scientific name. Do you know the scientific name of a bryophyte that grows on one of these two islands, anybody? I guess that's a hard question. Oh, here. Here's a bryophyte. And this came from our bryophyte data feed. So 2011 from San Jose State, Channel Islands, describing the location. I don't know how to pronounce this. Aloina aloides, I'm guessing. Aloina moss. Aloina aloides is a moss. It's native to California. It's a bryophyte. Moss. So we just added bryophyte, the capability to see and add bryophytes to Calflora a few months ago. And most of them come from, sorry, this um, consortium of North American bryophyte herbaria. So they had, I don't know, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of bryophyte observations for the state. And we sucked them into our data feed or, or one of our data feeds and serve them now. And that actually, I'm gonna write this down. It would be great if the legend could specify bryophytes. It does not at this point. Um, Let, I do remember that Selaginella is uh, a moss that is common on Santa Cruz Island. Is that S start with an S? Yeah, S-E-L-A-G-I-N-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. I had to look it up. S E L. <laughs> Okay, let's scroll down to SEL. I, I alphabetized the plant name. That's what I did first. P Q R. Uh -huh. Okay. 
Oh, this is painful. S E. Shine. Oh, a lot of Peruvian pepper <laughs> tree. Oh my goodness. S E S E. S C. Come on. So this one, right? Bigelow's moss fern. Is that the one you said? Oh uh, yeah, I didn't remember it was Bigelowi though, but yeah, I'll, I'll know it when I see it. So. So we don't have any, is we really, oh no, we do have some photos. Here's what this yeah. bryophyte looks, oh, it's actually, excuse me, it's not a bryophyte, it's a like, like a fight. Ah. And if you want to learn more about how they're different, you can click here. Um, here's some photos of this like a fight. And the distribution map shows them, like you said, on the Channel Islands. In what grows here, lichens are listed. Wow, they are? Well, that's cool. You learn something every day. I Joanne, I had I didn't know that. I'm so sorry. Um, I guess we could go back to our what grows here query. So I want to end this in just a couple minutes. We can look at our what grows here query. Let me see if there's any other. Oh, that's good. Okay, so there's no other questions other than this one from Joanne. Let's see if we can find some uh, lichens. There's oh. actually several more questions in the Q and A. Oh, there are. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Kimberly says. I have a couple photos to upload of bryophytes. That would be great. Oh, you don't know the scientific name. Well, here's what you can do if you don't know the scientific name for a bryophyte or a plant or anything that you upload to Calflora is you can put it in this group called Plant ID Help Group, which is about 500 people, maybe 200 are really, really knowledgeable, and the other 300 are wanting to gain more information like me, you know, not really all that knowledgeable um, but I'm looking for help with IDing some plants. So if you have um, uploaded your photo, you added your observation, you can leave it as scientific name unknown. And then I'll just go to one of my observations and add it to plant ID help group. I know that this Stefanomeria is correct, but let's just pretend like I'm not sure. So I'm gonna go to, I went from the homepage to my observations. And since I'm logged in as me or signed in as me, these are mine, I own them. I can decide to, I can edit them. Here's a close up. I can edit it so that if I'm worried about somebody poaching it, I can obscure the location and that way nobody will come and dig it up or collect it. I'm not for this Stephanomeria. I could leave it as private if I only want me to be able to see it. I could leave it as unpublished. That's that's just how observations come in from the phone app into Calflora, which is a big difference between iNaturalist and Calflora. There's a lot of big differences, but the fact that once you upload off the phone app, they're not published. No one can see them except for you. It's a conscious choice for you as the observer to publish it. And that I think some botanists are very careful and meticulous in their work. And I think that makes them, at least what we've heard, is it makes them feel more comfortable about uploading is that they know nobody can see it and they've had until they've had a chance to touch it, to edit it, to do what they want to do. Like I could um, put this photo first since that's a better photo. I could delete that photo since that's a person. I could um, say it's flowering because it is. I could say the number of plants I saw, which was one. You know, you can fill in as much of this information as you want and save it. And then, then if it's published, it's available to the, pu to the public. Now, if you're not sure what species it is, or if you just know it's Stefano Mary, you don't know the um, species, you go to group and then scroll. I'm, I'm a member of a lot of groups, so your list will be probably just two independent and then plant ID help group. If you join that group, where is it? Here it is, plant ID help group. And then if I save this, all the people who are a member of plant ID help group will get this email saying, Cynthia Powell's wondering if, this is correct. And they get a link to this location, to my photos, and they can decide, you know, yes, is this correct? Or if I had, if I was leaving it as unknown, then they could say, hey, this is Stefano Mary. I'm surprised it's blooming. And in October, um, I think it's Vergata, or I think it's whatever they think it might be. 
and if you're not yet a part of Plant ID Help Group, you can save it as independent since I know that one. You go from the home page to my CalFlora. And this, again, I'm signed in as me. So these are all the things that are customized to me. My observations, my profile, my groups, my comments, my preferences, like where should the map go automatically. Um, my searches, my email alerts. So I'm alerted when. I should set up an email alert so I'm alerted when Ken adds more photos to CalFlora or when Kimberly adds her bryophytes. Um, plant, you can create plant lists, your shapes. Anyway, this is too much information for tonight. I'm just going to show you how to join a group. These are my groups. First one's Plant ID Help Group. If I weren't part of it, it would show up under Join Another Group and say, do you want to join this group? And I would say yes. Oh, 820 members. Wow. <laughs> a lot but that's how um you can get help so that's it for tonight um thank you very much are there, Cynthia, there, a there was one uh, last question okay one last one invasive and was... that was from scott and um you just showed us the edit page so you can delete your own observations yeah but he's wondering like if a plant gets extirpated from somewhere is it still going to show up uh on uh on the site that is such a good question we have something called history stacks where you can see if i can think of my history stacks right now um you can show change over time so if something is you know invasive and you've managed it and it's no longer there you can show in 2010 we had three acres and 2015 we had one and now in 2022 we have zero acres and we think it's gone but then in 2023 you might find that there's actually a seed bank quite longer than you thought and it came back so i won't show you exactly how to do that now because we ran out of time but um if you want to learn more about how to do that there's a youtube channel for calflora and you can see like a three minute video about how to create history stacks in calflora showing change over time for whether it's extirpated or change the population's growing whether it's rare or invasive but that is a great question thank you very much you guys had great questions all right a round of applause for cynthia <laughs> uh thank, thank you, you so much um you you stimulated a lot of really good questions and uh i want to make sure <laughs> applause <laughs> Uh, came into the Q and A. That's nice. Uh, I want to make sure that I do get all my uh, iNaturalist observations in there because they tend to be uh, mostly rare plants on the Channel Islands. So uh, we'll uh, we'll figure that out. Okay, that sounds good. I should say that we don't actually get uh, any rare plants from iNaturalist into CalFlora in our automatic data feed. But there's a there's a way you can get your rare plants into CalFlora, but because iNaturalist obscures them, um, and we oh, have yeah. anyway, yeah. But that's a great idea. So let's do that. Okay. Well, thank you so very much, Cynthia. You've um, got an amazing uh, tool here. I, I've been using it off and on for a long time um, to help me ID things. And uh, I, I know that recently you've been uh, striking out in a lot of different directions, and I can see that this site has become so much more uh, useful over time. And uh, I will personally start making use of it myself uh, more than I have. And I hope everybody else does too, because this is a really, really neat project. Thanks so Thank much you. for joining us. Thank you. Good night.